Hello, and welcome to Profiles in American Lutheran Church Music, a project of the Center for Church Music at Concordia University, Chicago. My name is Zebulon Hyben. I am a Lutheran church musician and composer currently serving at Duke University as Director of Chapel Music and Associate Professor of Church Music. And I'm here with our interviewee, Robert Buckley Farley, known to most of us in the Lutheran church music world as Bob Farley. And we're here at Christ Church Lutheran in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the parish where Bob has served as cantor and associate pastor since 1981. But most of us in church music know Bob better for one of two other professional hats that he wears, the first being his work on the editorial staff of Augsburg Fortress Publishers from 2001 to 2018, particularly his integral role as an editor of Evangelical Lutheran Worship, the 2006 hymnal of the ELCA. And the second role is his work as a composer. Bob has written myriad anthems, liturgical uh, settings, and hymn tunes that are widely published and sung throughout the church. Bob is a graduate of Concordia Seward, now Concordia, Nebraska, and Christ Seminary Seminex, and studied composition with Theodore Beck, Stephen McCursey, Richard Hillert, and Jan Bender. Bob, I was wondering if you could start by telling us just a bit about your earliest formation in music and worship, the church where you grew up and what it was like, and some of your earliest memories of worship and music making. Sure. Yeah, I grew up in Los Angeles um, at a little Missouri Synod congregation out there that happened to be the same one that that the late Scott Weidler belonged to, oh. so I, I knew him his whole life. Um, but yeah, it was um, a congregation of immigrants, mostly from the Midwest, um, and and that's where I got my initial formation. It was not a, a high church place, um, not one with a particularly high quality of music, mm -hmm. but it was... Um, it was a good, good formative place for me. The, you know, it was during the baby boom, and so there are plenty of young children there for the junior choir, and then a, a good sized senior choir. Mm -hmm. um, so music was was always part of that. Um, it had a pipe organ that was so so quality, mm -hmm. but uh, I always was very interested in in that and the organ. Uh, playing and I'd be hanging around the, the organ console quite a bit. Um, and just in my my childhood, um, you know, I've, I've always been kind of an introvert kind of person and, and I remember playing games often by myself and always having a soundtrack running mm. through my head. To the game. To the game, yeah. yeah. Mm. Which, and I still have random melodies just running through my head most of the time that I can just pull on. But, um, so that's, yeah, music has been a part of my life from early on. Um, my parents weren't trained musicians, but my father loved to sing, and on road trips he'd be singing songs that he knew or whistling or, or something like that. And um, both my mother and father sang in the church choir. When did you start formal instruction and, and what what mm -hmm. formal instruction was first for you yeah i took, started taking piano lessons i think in second grade mm -hmm. uh, from one of the teachers there at the missouri synod school mm -hmm. uh, so it was first lutheran of culver city and paul so, mm -hmm. um so i yeah i took piano lessons then through um well into high school um when i was in high school i started taking some organ lessons just Preliminarily, I didn't really do much organ work mm. until I was in college. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, the, again, not a lot of formal training until I got got to college. But it was always a part of my life. I went to Lutheran High School and sang in the choir there with Bud Bisbee, who was a very formative mm. choir director mm. for me. So then, was Concordia Seward um, just a logical choice because of? growing up in the Missouri Parish and going to a Lutheran high school, or did you have family connections or other things that kind of sent you to be interested yeah. in that campus over other ones? Yeah, that's a, a good question. I I had by that time decided I wanted to either be a, 
a pastor or a teacher. Mm -hmm. And because of the musical interest, I gravitated toward the teacher part of that. And at that time, there were two Missouri Senate Teachers Colleges, the one at Seward and the one at River Forest. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was just trying to decide between the two. And I thought, well, I've lived my whole life in a big city in Los Angeles. <laughs> and uh, my, my mother was from Nebraska. My grandparents still lived in northeastern Nebraska. So I decided, well, yeah, I'll go that way. And, hmm. um, there were times when I regretted that. Not so much for the quality of the school, but Seward was a town of 5,000. and So missing, missing the city. <laughs> there, yeah. yeah, I was missing Culturally, the city. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you were at Seward, who were your primary teachers or influences? Who mm -hmm. shaped you the most during your time? Yeah. My advisor was Charles Orr, mm -hmm. um, another subject for one of these videos. Um, and I was just really impressed with his creativity. Mm -hmm. um, he was a wonderful, is a wonderful improviser. Um, and he was also a very good, good organ teacher. So that was one. Uh, and Theodore Beck, when, when I started studying uh, music theory with him mm -hmm. and started writing things, I, that was really the beginning of my composing. Mm -hmm. And he was very encouraging of, of me in that, in that field. Um, he was, when I graduated, he was encouraging me to consider going to his, where he did his doctoral work, which is Northwestern. Mm -hmm. um, to pursue I, composition. To pursue com composition. composition. And I, at that time, I wanted to try out, try my hand at, at teaching. Mm -hmm. I, I did try it, my hand at teaching and did not do all that well at it. So, <laughs> what, what, where did you what where did you teach and what what uh, what age groups? Yeah, it was um, in St. Louis mm -hmm. um, middle school mm -hmm. age, and I just didn't have the knack for keeping order <laughs> discipline <laughs> in the classroom. So it just kind of I crashed and burned at that but um, it, it takes a special kind of a it does I have a, to a, teach middle school especially have so much respect for <laughs> middle school yeah. teachers now um, but since I was in st. Louis then and in my teaching I'd gotten to know some of the professors at mm -hmm. uh, then Concordia Seminary um, especially uh, George and Dor Hoyer I Dor Hoyer was a teacher that I worked with mm -hmm. And Paul and Jeanette Bauermeister, Jeanette was also a teacher that mm -hmm. I worked with. Mm -hmm. um, so around Bethel, Bethel Lutheran Church in University City, mm -hmm. which is adjacent to the Concordia campus. And so then when the teaching wasn't working out, I just thought I'd go with my plan B. And mm -hmm. um, not necessarily planning on being a pastor as my full-time vocation, mm -hmm. but I was very interested in getting that theological Theological education. education. Yeah. So was Charles or your first organ teacher then? He was. He, he yes. was your first. Yeah. Yeah. He, he and David Shack were both at Con Concordia at that time, mm -hmm. and uh, I worked quite a bit with both of them. Mm -hmm. And then when you went to, so you you go to St. Louis and you teach for a for a bit, and then enroll at Concordia. Um, what happens to the musical part of your life? Are you still? Mm -hmm. Taking lessons? Are you are you playing for chapel? What what were you? How were you balancing the pastoral theological yeah. education with the, the musician side? Yeah, I they had the seminary chorus mm -hmm. uh, that um, Robert Berk was the primary conductor of that. But then he was on sabbatical one of my first years, and Mark Bangert took mm -hmm. over. So mm -hmm. that was my introduction mm -hmm. to Mark. Um, but I did play some at uh, Bethel played organ at Bethel, mm -hmm. and also played some for chapel mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And upon graduation from what became Christ Seminary, Seminary X, um, what was the next step? So were you looking for, you said you weren't necessarily going into seminary, thinking, mm -hmm. I want to be a pastor, uh, mm -hmm. a parish pastor full-time. Um, were you somewhere before you came to Christ Church, or was there another, um, or was this the first, sort of the first port of call, the first? Uh, yeah, there's a brief stop at uh, a 
another congregation, um, Christ Memorial, up here in the Twin Cities mm -hmm. area mm -hmm. uh, in Plymouth. But yeah, I think while I was at seminary, um, Mark Bangert became my primary advisor. Mm -hmm. And for me and for other si similar people who had interest both in uh, pastoral ministry and musical ministry, he was a wonderful role model mm -hmm. because he himself was a pastor and a musician mm -hmm. as well as a scholar. Um, so he kind of took us under his wing and said, yes, you can mm -hmm. can be both things. That's funny you say that because Mark, it was briefer, mm -hmm. but um, I, when I was visiting seminaries, I went to LSTC um, mm -hmm. just to visit, th trying to decide and, and had a meeting with Mark. It was very brief and I'm sure mm -hmm. he doesn't remember it, but mm -hmm. he actually said, you know, if you really are more interested in the musical side, mm -hmm which he could sense, even though I don't think I was saying, he said, you may not want to come to LSTC because mm -hmm. we don't have a program in the same way that, that Luther Seminary and sure. St. Olaf do at that point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's, a lovely human and thoughtful. Yeah, thoughtful. that program wasn't around at that time. Yeah, yeah. And so actually he and I, I, I stayed, after I had my Master of Divinity, I stayed on and did a uh, Master of Sacred Theology mm. with an emphasis in liturgy and church music, mm -hmm. again, with Mark Bangard mm -hmm. as a primary sure, right. advisor. Um, and that I did that partly because um, I had met my wife in seminary, Jane Buckley Farley, um, and she was a few years behind me, so I was just, mm -hmm. well, I'll just hang around <laughs> <laughs> for a while. Right. Um, and it just turned out to be a kind of a extension of, of my seminary education there and worked out very well. When the time came to leave St. Louis and, and mm -hmm. migrate to mm -hmm. Minnesota, the Twin Cities, what was the attraction? Was it simply that here were some churches with positions open that looked like good yeah, um, vocational that was, fits? That was basically it. Yeah. I mean, at that time there weren't many pastoral calls available for, for Seminex graduates mm -hmm. because the whole structure of yeah. The Association of Evangelical ELCA. Lutheran Churches and then ELCA wasn't yet did not yet exist yet. really in, mm -hmm. in place, um, and um, Jane, when she graduated, found a advanced CPE position mm -hmm. at the University of Minnesota, mm -hmm. and so I found us a, a part time position at uh, Christ Memorial Lutheran. I see, and I was only there for a year, a little over a year. Mm -hmm. um, serving kind of as a, a youth director and choir director and musician. All and, of the hats. Yeah, so yeah. All those kinds of things. <laughs> uh, occasionally doing some preaching, but mm -hmm. more other, mm -hmm. other things. Um, so I was there for a brief time, and then I knew some people here at, um, at Christ Lutheran Church, Christ Church Lutheran, actually. And uh, one of them was a, an associate pastor here that I had gone to seminary with. And he said, you know, our our music director is leaving. Would you be interested in applying for it? So, and that, it obviously had more musical opportunities here than, mm -hmm. than that suburban mm -hmm. church. So I came and I've been here ever since. <laughs> so it started as the position here then was to be the cantor, to be the director of music, mm -hmm. primarily. Primarily. Um, and then did, was was being a part of the clergy team um, because you also happened to be a pastor and ordained, or did mm -hmm. they sort of fuse that together, or did that evolve over time? Yeah, it was originally primarily just because they knew that I needed a, a call, mm -hmm. a pastoral call to stay on the, stay on the roster. roster and all yep. that. Mm -hmm. um, and the the senior pastor at that time, Albert Nybacher, was very open to helping Seminex mm -hmm. graduates in that mm -hmm. way. So yeah, it was I just became an associate pastor, but again, yeah, serving pr initially primarily just as as music director. Mm -hmm. um, a few years later, the the other the Seminex grad who had been here took a different call. Mm -hmm. And so that then I came on board full time here at Christ Church, partly as a pastor, partly as, mm -hmm. as the cantor here. As long as we're talking about Christ Church, mm -hmm. maybe you could tell us a little bit um, about this place and its history and um, 
you know, its its importance in the American Lutheran liturgy, church music mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. landscape. Because, I mean, it's known, but because it's not a large church and a large, mm-hmm. really large program, I think there are probably, maybe especially some of our younger church music colleagues who aren't as mm-hmm. aware of, of Christ Church. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Christ Church Lutheran... Um, is known mostly for its architecture. Um, the the church, the worship uh, building was designed by Eliel Saarinen, a Finnish American architect. Um, the education building where we're taping this um, was done by his son, Eero Saarinen, best known for the St. Louis Arch and mm-hmm. Dulles Airport and projects like that. Uh, but they were both major um, architects of the mid 20th century, um, and in fact, we still this complex now is now a national historic mm-hmm. landmark. The only only place of worship in the state that's that's a national historic landmark. And oh, I didn't realize that. The only one in all of Minnesota. Only one. Yeah. Oh, no, interesting. Yeah, and interesting. it's because it's it was so formative for other modern style mm. church buildings. Um, that we still get busloads of architects from mm. around the mm. world visiting, oh, right. <laughs> visiting it. And I would say to church musicians, if you've never been to this parish to um, just to see it and to worship here, even just tour, it's mm. very much worth the stop when you're when you're passing through for the beauty yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah we're period. we're very used to hosting mm-hmm. visitors, so you <laughs> you'd be very welcome to to come here. Um, but it's also um, has a a strong musical heritage. Mm-hmm. Um, as you say, it's not the size of program that, or the the f- famous quality that the uh, Mount Olive or mm-hmm. Central Lutheran have, but um, Walter Peltz is a former music director here. Um, it, when, during its heyday, um, this church was, I think, about 1,500 members. Mm-hmm. So at that time, it was a, a it large was a congregation. Large mm-hmm. um, the uh, the split between Missouri Synod and AELC took a lot of the members, and then a large employer in the neighborhood closed, and mm-hmm. so it declined mm-hmm. pretty As precipitously changed, yeah. back in the in the seventies. Mm-hmm. But uh, but it still has a, a really strong worship life, and uh, and the musical piece of it has continued to be really important. And it's been a wonderful place for me professionally because mm-hmm. they were very supportive of me spending a lot of time just composing, mm-hmm. um, giving me the time and the freedom to do that. And the choir has always been patient with me trying out things on them. And <laughs> I think the last time that I was here at worship was the week that the Association of Lutheran Church Musicians National Conference was here in the Twin Cities. Oh, yeah. And I came, I came to worship a piece of yours was um, was um, premiering, mm-hmm. um, and I looked around at all of the other um, kind of ALCM leaders and mm-hmm. and cantors and things who were at worship, and it, it struck me at that moment that you know the people who know uh, <laughs> about about the importance of church music and different they they're here they're here yeah. this morning um, yeah. yeah it was a nice it was a very nice service. Lovely liturgy, but you never had a very good organ until no, recently, no, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> What's the? Tell us about the instrument a little yeah, bit. Yeah, the the organ that was there when I got here. Um, the previous organist on his way out told me this isn't a very good organ, <laughs> and <laughs> at some point it'd be wonderful to replace it, but you know, in, the money just wasn't there. In 1981. Yeah. That's, okay. It was a a Casavant, but or mostly Casavant. But it had been assembled in the 1950s, not by the Casavan Organ Company, but by their local representative, um, who just bought the console and parts of it, and he kind of cobbled it together, hmm. not entirely successfully. <laughs> um, and so, it, yeah, it had multiple problems. Um, but again, the money just wasn't there mm-hmm. for a long time to mm-hmm. replace it. And then in the... In the 1990s, um, a couple a couple members here were dying, and they just told the pastor, "We know that the organ is is a need for you, and 
to our astonishment, they they left a gift in the the high six figures wow. as the basis for mm-hmm. for getting a new organ, mm-hmm. and so then that was combined with a a fun drive, and we were able to uh, to commission a new Dobson organ, which we've had now for about three years, and mm-hmm. it's just a a delight, <laughs> you know, to have an organ that was designed for this, for this space, space yeah. uh, fits the acoustics really well. And, and there were some challenges that I remember with the, the historical registry designation mm-hmm. for the building, right? You had to be careful about how the pipework went in and what was changed about the sort right. of aesthetic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we had originally talked with Holt Camp because they had an organ that had come out of a church in Cleveland and mm-hmm. they were trying to find a home for it. And it happened to be the... F- I think the first organ in the country that had a rook positif oh, wow. hanging off the balcony. But because this is a, a National Historic Landmark, um, the preservation people said, no, you can't change you can't the look that. of it. Oh, wow. And in fact, they, they said, well, what about if we just put a few ranks of pipes in front of the facade, mm-hmm. in front of the screen that the rest of the organ is behind and the set? No, you can't do that. Hmm. So the yeah the entire new organ and Dobson is known for their beautiful organ yes, cases. Yes, yes, absolutely. And they couldn't do that. Wow. Uh, they had to put the pipe pipework behind the screen, which mm-hmm. in it was a shame in itself visually, but also that meant it limited the size of the of instrument, the instrument yeah. um, because it had to fit there. Mm-hmm. What we were able to do is to have Lynn Dobson design a a new console that's just gorgeous and it was designed with the architecture Architecture, in mind. yeah. It's so, a beautiful console. So and it's a beautiful really instrument. Well. I mean, it doesn't sound like the challenges you went through to mm-hmm. make it work with the restrictions of the Preservation Society mm-hmm. um, are not obvious in the sound of no. the instrument in the room, by any means. Yeah, yeah. I mean, fortunately, that the screen is pretty uh, sonically transparent. Mm-hmm. And it, whereas there was a lot of structure behind the screen. We were able to remove that. Field so screen, yeah. so mm-hmm. the sound really projects well from, mm-hmm. from that position. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about composing last because I think that'll be, um, we might spin off in various mm-hmm. directions. But talk a little bit um, about your work at Augsburg Fortress. I know enough about editing to know how critical the work of the editors mm-hmm. can be in any um, publication, especially something as large as a, you know, an anthology. And there were several anthologies put out during your time at Oxford, um, but a, but even more so a hymnal. But it's also not the sort of thing that you know people crack open the book and immediately want mm-hmm. to know who who mm-hmm. edited it. Mm-hmm. Um, can you just talk a little bit about your role as an editor and and what that kind of work is like and how that um, how that serves the church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I actually began my editing work when it was Augsburg Publishing House mm-hmm. in the early 80s mm-hmm. when I was just part-time at the church and I needed to fill out some more employment. Mm-hmm. And so I, I was working at that time in the uh, curriculum area. But that kind of taught me some of the editorial skills, mm-hmm. the basic ones. And then, yeah, as they were starting to get serious about creating a new hymnal to, to replace Lutheran Book of Worship. Um, Frank Stolt at that time um, was head of the, the worship team at Augsburg Fortress, and he asked if, if I would return to the house and become an editor for them. And initially it was not so much with the, the hymnal process. Um, I would stepped in as... Um, I guess it would be the third editor of Sundays and Seasons. Okay. Working with sure. that for quite a while. But um, the hymnal process was so massive and the schedule was so short that mm-hmm. I soon got pulled into that. Mm-hmm. Partly on editorial teams, which in the ELW uh, preparation were the, the ones would have a particular chunk of, of work, like Holy mm-hmm. Communion editorial team and mm-hmm. the church's year were two that I served on. Mm-hmm. Others were daily prayer and occasional services and things like that, baptism. Um, so I, I was able to work on the development side of it 
in that way. But then um, when, when it became closer to being finalized, I, I got pulled in a lot on the editorial work of the book itself, mm-hmm. or the books. Um, and I, I worked a lot on the, the musical side of that. Um, I wasn't part of choosing the hymns, but mm-hmm. once they came in, I, I worked on that. And as far as what, what the work is like, it's, it's a lot of really picky detail work. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, how it's going to, to look, what kind of editorial standards mm-hmm. are going to be governing this particular mm-hmm. piece, which could be different from, from other things that we'd be publishing. Mm-hmm. From resource to resource, it, yeah. it isn't necessarily consistent. Yeah. 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 So it was yeah, doing all that, that detailed stuff. Um, and we had you know, so many hymns in ELW, mm-hmm. and not to mention the service music, that um, keeping that consistency across was a was a major challenge and i would imagine if i may good work for someone who ha- has an introvert's personality mm-hmm. it's because it's so it's so detail oriented and it's you need probably a lot of quiet and concentration and mm-hmm. the ability to sort of yes, <laughs> focus it's, yeah. the, it's the opposite yeah. of what people often perceive as the role of musicians mm-hmm. you know being mm-hmm. Yeah. Collaborative and in front of people and leading a congregation and assembly song, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and also keeping in mind that I'm not there to make my work obvious; just the mm-hmm. opposite. Yes, you know, yes. You want to be in the background and not not be noticed. And I, I have to say that just working with with Martin Seltz, as he was the Augsburg Fortress lead mm-hmm. uh, person for. For evangelical losing worship, and he, he comes from a heritage of hymnal editors. His father was a hymnal mm-hmm. editor back with the Lutheran Hymnal, and uh, he was he just has the temperament and the skills mm-hmm. that were ideal for mm-hmm. for bringing that to fruition. And for those who may not know, you and Martin have been a team uh, at Augsburg, but also here at Christ Church for. How many years now? When did he come on board as part of the music um, staff? Yeah, as part of the music staff, he came on board when I joined. Um, when you joined Augsburg. Augsburg Fortress. Oh, wow. okay. Because I thought it's going to be really challenging for me to hold down a full time position there and still keep the music going here. So, he, mm-hmm. and he is like me, a Seminex graduate who mm-hmm. has both pastoral and musical mm-hmm. background. Okay. So he agreed to come on as co-cantor and he's we still have that partnership going here mm-hmm. yeah so we've known each other since seminary um, and we've worked here and simultaneously for a long time at, at Augsburg mm-hmm. Fortress mm-hmm. and I want to go back just to one thing you said about um, the work of the editor being to make your work not obvious mm-hmm. I mean there are some nice parallels there to the work of a church musician as a leader of assembly song, you know, mm-hmm. it isn't supposed to be about mm-hmm. us so much. Um, right. It's reflected in the architecture of a place like Christ Church, where the mm-hmm. choir and the console are in the balcony behind the mm-hmm. assembly, so the sound mm-hmm. carries them forward. It's yeah. a servant. It's it a is. servant role. It is, yeah. And I think the most successful church musicians are are people who recognize that. I mean, there are some wonderful organists out there who just don't have that temperament, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. they, they want to be performers. Mm-hmm. And and they they play literature much better than I do, but not, not necessarily leader lead of him. Yeah. church's song. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about composition um, and about your your sort of your study, your interest in it, your um, your approach, all those mm-hmm. all those sorts of things. Um, is there can you is there an early piece when you were at Concordia Surrey that you can remember sort of writing or the first thing that was that you played or led in worship or that someone else played or led that you had written? Yeah, um, Mark Bangert was really uh, supportive of having new music written when he was directing the seminary chorus, and I was actually there at the same time as Paul Weber, another. 
uh, musician mm-hmm. pastor. I didn't uh, realize you were there at the same time. Yeah, he was one year ahead of me, mm-hmm. and so he was writing things. I was writing things, mm-hmm. um, and so when we'd go on tour with the seminary chorus, he would usually have a couple mm-hmm. new pieces, mm-hmm. um, but also just for worship services, um, he'd ask ask me to write something something new. So there's one that stands out. Um, it was actually my first published piece. It was written for the seminary chorus, and it was kind of an odd piece because we were going on on tour, and he wanted something, even though we were touring in the spring, he wanted something that had a Christmas focus. But he said if it could kind of bring in Easter too. <laughs> so, yeah, okay, well, how am I going to do this? <laughs> Um, because I think you had a church year emphasis on mm-hmm. that tour for the program. program. For the concert program. So what, you know, in collaboration with him, what we ended up doing is combining uh, From Himmel Hoch, the, mm-hmm. From Heaven Above, with the psalm for, I think it's the second or third Sunday of Easter, Psalm 30. Mm-hmm. You have turned my wailing into dancing. dancing. Mm-hmm. And so I combined the two... Um, and I was kind of influenced by uh, Heinz Wiener Zimmermann. Mm-hmm, yeah. So we had a, a kind of a plucked string bass thing going and harpsichord and oboe. Excellent. And then the chorus. So it was alternating some of the psalm verses with, with the stanzas of the stanzas of, of the Quran. Quran. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. So that, I think it got called Choral Fantasy on a hymn tune or something mm-hmm. like that. And who um, published it? Concordia. Concordia. Yeah. So that was... My first published <laughs> piece. So oboe, if I had to pick an instrument that I associated with your mm-hmm. writing, mm-hmm. Um, you know, if I was going to say, Bob, would you write a hymn concertato for mm-hmm. me uh, and organ assembly choir, an obligato instrument, mm-hmm. it would be my assumption that your go-to would be the oboe. Is yeah. that a fair, no, that, I mean, is that a favorite yeah. timbre for you? It is, yeah. yeah. And also just, I've known some fine o- mm-hmm. oboists mm-hmm. and Mark Bangert, is a wonderful oboist, and when I was in seminary, there was also a student who was uh, Joel Schmitz, who was a fine oboist. And then when I came up here, um, I got to know Marilee Clemp. Mm-hmm. Actually, her father was supposed to be my internship supervisor because I, oh, really? I <laughs> skipped over that, but I did my internship up here in Excelsior, and he was supposed to be my supervisor, but he had to retire because of diabetes mm-hmm. right before I came, but they were still around, and so mm-hmm. I got to know Marilee, who was at that time an Oxford College student, mm-hmm. and she's a wonderful oboist. So Fantastic. Yeah. So actually, every Christmas, I write a piece for oboe and organ mm-hmm. based on Carol. And she, for the Christmas Eve service. For the Christmas Day yeah. service. Actually. Christmas Day. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So she comes and plays that and a few yeah. past pieces, but yeah. yeah, I've written, you're right, I've written a lot that use oboe, and I just love the, mm-hmm. the sound of that. Mm-hmm. What do you think your primary, if you, if you think that you have one, if you believe that you have a, a, a primary method or approach or an, an element that uh, melody, harmony, structure, rhythm that you start with when you're thinking about mm-hmm. writing a, a new piece? Yeah. I think for me it's always been melody. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if I'm arranging a Hispanic piece as as I have done, then mm-hmm. you know, try to take on the the rhythmic aspects of that and mm-hmm. do justice to that. But but melody, I think, has always been my my strong mm-hmm. strong suit. Um, in fact, when I'm composing the melody, partly because <laughs> my whole life I've had melodies going through my head, so that part is is fairly easy, and then. The harmony, um, I'm fascinated by what can be done mm. with harmony. Trying, I'm always kind of not content to just go with a, a standard harmony, mm-hmm. just try to make something a little more interesting. Um, so that that comes comes next, mm-hmm. the melody and then the harmony and, and the rhythm. Yeah. How much do you care about... I'm asking this sort of composer to composer because I'm mm-hmm. curious. How much do you care about or attend to the rules, you know, mm-hmm. that we're all taught about um, voice leading and, you know, what you double and don't double in a chord? And, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, at some point we all reach, I think, the place where we decide 
which rules matter to us and which ones we're going to mm-hmm. throw out or freely ignore. Mm-hmm. But um, do you have a general sort of, you know, never double the third or avoid parallel? Are there certain things mm-hmm. that stuck with yeah. you from your, you know, your early <laughs> yeah. years of, of theory teaching? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, and I know that some some of my fellow church musicians are probably aware of this that I tend often not to pay much attention to that. I I tend to write by the seat of my pants. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's always fun to have someone like Paul Westermeyer analyze a hymn, <laughs> a hymn that That's I've right. written. Because, oh, I did that? I, you know, I just right. not even aware of it. And, uh, and in fact, one year, quite a while back now, I filled in for David Feenan at Gustavus um, teaching Gustavus theory. Gustavus Adolphus College. Yeah, mm-hmm. teaching uh, theory, among other things, also playing mm-hmm. organ. But um, I really had to relearn a lot of my theory <laughs> then because I just haven't <laughs> Things we've set aside and don't pay much attention to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, is there a difference between how you approach writing a piece for you? Merrily and, and yourself to play on Christmas Day or a choral anthem and song for the assembly, things that you're going to put in the mouths of the congregation. Yeah, very much so. Um, I'm just so congregational song oriented that I'm always thinking, okay, how can I make this easy for the congregation mm-hmm. without having it being boring, boring. For, yep. for them? Mm-hmm. So how can I with voice leading, um, with you know, the range, um, all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. How, I mean, it, it can be a very interesting piece, but if the congregation can't sing it, or if they struggle with it, then mm-hmm. it's not going to be mm-hmm. be successful as as congregation song. So I, um, that's a an important piece for me when I'm writing that type of music, mm-hmm. um, and sometimes. I'll get toward the end of a a piece and it just isn't feeling right because of that. Mm -hmm. And so then I'll go back and tweak it or rewrite it or Mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. You've done a number of hymn collaborations with uh, with the Susans, as we sometimes say, (laughs) Susan Briel and Susan Sherwin. Mm -hmm. Um, Are there any of, of your collaborations with them? Well, maybe, is there, what's the difference between just writing a hymn tune based on an extant text mm-hmm. and collaborating with a living poet mm-hmm. um, who you know has their own process and their own thoughts about how the structure goes together and, and how that kind of comes together as a whole, a whole yeah. package. That's an interesting question because, yeah, when you have a, a text that's been around, partly it's often known to a, mm-hmm. a particular tune, so then the tune that you're daring to <laughs> replace it with. Must break that association. Yeah, yeah, yeah it has yeah. to break it, and there has to be a good reason for mm-hmm. that. Good reason to break At it. At least in my head, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. if it's something like a kind of a soupy 19th century hymn, then it may be beloved, and other people won't want a, a new tune for that, but I'll just still sometimes say, well, how about this? You know, mm-hmm. you may not like it, and that's fine. But <laughs> Gebrauch's but, music, yeah, yeah, Gebrauch's yeah. music. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, working with a a new text is is my favorite way of doing that, mm. especially when you have such gifted uh, mm-hmm. writers as as Susan Briel, Susan Paolo Cherwin, um, and a few others that I've worked with along the way. But those two have been my favorites because they are so so willing to listen to my feedback about their text, which is usually overwhelmingly positive, Mm -hmm. but um, willing to listen, especially this, how this would work musically Mm -hmm. and make changes Mm -hmm. to their text to make that work. Mm -hmm. And then of course, the other way, the other direction also that I'm paying attention to what they're trying to express Mm -hmm. just with a text Mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how I can make that come out clearly Mm -hmm. so that their intentions are are honored. A real literal sense of music broken open to the Mm -hmm. word. Yeah, yeah. 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 And both of of those Susans um, have been just joys to Mm -hmm. work with. 
I've written more with with Susan Cherwin, um, but I've enjoyed yeah both mm -hmm. both of those and and Christ Church here has has commissioned texts from both of them mm -hmm. also. Do you have any favorite of your hymn tunes that um, you know if you had mm -hmm. to. If you were stranded on a desert island yeah, right. with a hymnal with all the pages ripped out, uh -huh. except a couple of Farley tunes, yeah. which, which ones would you choose? Yeah, well, one of them would be uh, Oh Blessed Spring. Mm. Uh, the tune name is Bergland after my mother's maiden name. Mm -hmm. But that was, I think, one of my first published hymns was Blessed Spring, and I remember I wrote that um, in the early 90s. I had gotten to know Susan Sherwin from working with her on an ALCM conference, mm -hmm. and then as that was all winding up, I said, I, I got to know her as a poet, and I said, do you happen to have any hymn texts? <laughs> and she sent me a, a packet of, mm. of some of her, her texts. I mean, now she has three volumes published of them, but... Um, and Oh Blessed Spring just jumped out at me, mm. the, the way it traced the, the human life from baptism mm -hmm. through death and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, it's a beautiful text, and the way the tune floats, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it just sort of, I don't know, it, it, your melody with those words yeah, it traces the journey of life. I mean, mm -hmm. there are moments when the melodic line feels like it moves a little quicker, mm -hmm. and other movements where it seems to move a little slower. Mm -hmm. But the whole thing has this gentle trajectory that, mm -hmm. you know, God willing, when we look back, hopefully mm -hmm. we feel like um, it's been a gentle, a gentle river, mm -hmm. mostly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a lo that's a lovely, lovely pairing. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. One of my proudest moments was we had... Shortly after I had written that, there was a composer's workshop thing held at Luther Seminary, mm -hmm. and uh, Carl Schock was there as kind of a, a senior mentor, mm -hmm. and so that was the first time that hymn had ever been sung. Oh, wow. And In front of Carl. Yeah, it was, Carl it was in front of, and he said afterwards, I wish I had written that too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's, he's kind of that's, God to do all him to him tune, yeah. tune writers and yeah. Because it's not easy. I mean, it is a different compositional skill set mm -hmm. to be able to write hymn tunes well mm -hmm. than to be able to write anthems or voluntaries yeah. or other types of music. Yeah. It is not the same task. Mm -hmm. And of course, he was the, the sort master. of the grandfather yeah. for for Lutherans in this. Yeah. Last hundred years. Um, I was going to say something else about that. Oh, so was the pu first publication of Bergland and O Blessed Spring in With One Voice? It was, yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I guess I'm, as far as other hymns that I'm fond of, um, one with Susan Briel's text, Holy God. Mm. Um, Holy and Glorious. Holy and Glorious mm. is, is another one that's been well received and it's just kind of one of the, it's a quirky melody, mm -hmm. the way it starts, um, because it kind of slides into mm -hmm. the, the first syllable, holy God, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. And, and some people have not appreciated that, mm -hmm. um, not liked the way that, that begins. And I can understand that. Yeah. But it's a quirky visual. text too, right? Because that text started as prayers. Do I have the story right? Those were prayer petitions Originally, a set of prayer petitions that Susan wrote for um, Paul Nelson's Paul funeral. Paul Nelson's funeral. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So, in a sense, what you were setting with those first words was not the first word of a poetic hymn stanza. That's right. Yeah. But the the um, the naming of God, sort of the bidding part of the mm -hmm. of a prayer collect. So it right. ought to have a little bit of a mm -hmm. maybe a different trajectory yeah. than here yeah. here beginneth the stanza. Right. Yeah. And that's something also that him tune writers always have to consider is mm -hmm. not just how it fits with one stanza, but how it fits with, with all of them. The whole text. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, which can be a, mm -hmm. a major challenge sometimes. Mm -hmm. Those are both lovely, uh, lovely hymns. And um, 
I'm sure we're only at what there's we've got a supplement new supplement now all creation mm-hmm. sings but when the next generation hymnal comes along I'm sure they'll uh, they'll move move forward um, and you like to experiment in different genres too right I you won I think the inaugural uh, Robbie Prize mm-hmm. for um, Excellence in Sacred Composition, sponsored mm-hmm. by the Association of Lutheran Church Musicians, for a set of a jazz liturgy for Good Friday, a solemn um, reproaches. Is solemn that right? reproaches. Yeah, yeah, with the jazz yeah. influence. Yeah, yeah, that was one that was requested by Mark Banger mm-hmm. when he was directing music at St. Luke mm-hmm. Lutheran in Chicago, and they'd always done the solemn reproaches. Um, but there were some new texts for that that seemed more ec- ecumenically sensitive, mm-hmm. not blaming everything on the Jews. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so he asked if I could do a new setting of it. And I don't know if he suggested the, the jazz kind of influence or if that was something that I came up with, but um, it seemed to fit, it, mm-hmm. kind of a bluesy, mm-hmm. you know, how have I offended you? Mm-hmm. That, that sense of lament that's yeah. inherent in some some blues and jazz yeah. music. Yeah. So it's yeah for mm. a solo cantor with piano, mm-hmm. and then a chorus, choir coming in with the, mm-hmm. the chorus on that. But yeah, but I do enjoy yeah trying out different genres. Um, a couple times when I was challenged to arrange something like a Hispanic tune or something like that, I I've considered using a pen name, you know, like Roberto de los mm. Angeles. <laughs> but, you know, I, and that, again, there's the sensitivity of yeah. trying to be pretend I'm someone I'm not. Mm-hmm. And yet, some of these genres are so rich. Mm-hmm. And it's just to try out, try out my hand. Mm-hmm. And, something. and I think when you approach things with uh, humility and a willingness to, to not take offense if someone, mm-hmm. uh, if it is not received in the way you right. intended, right. Um, that goes a long way, and you have sort of you sort of exude those mm. those characteristics. To conclude, I wondered if you might tell us a bit about what you think the primary challenges and opportunities are that are facing um, church musicians today. Mm. Yeah, well, I think one is just when I was growing up, um, there was this wealth of tradition. And it was um, pretty closely hewed to, which had advantages and and disadvantages. But um, that that treasury of shared knowledge about where this music and the church music in general, Lutheran church music in particular, came from, um, what the strengths were, what the traditions were, all that was very strong back then, and I think it's less so now, mm-hmm. um, partly because um, schools are challenged by many other things, and so they're not paying as much attention to that. Um, but I think that is is a loss, because there's a lot of, of just shared um, awareness that we can't depend on Common anymore. vocabulary. Common, common vocabulary, so. yeah, both among the musicians and mm-hmm. and people in the congregation, worshipers and listeners uh, that we don't have. But on the flip side of that, um, I think what's sometimes lamented by more traditionally oriented people as the loss of that, we maybe have lost some of that because of some wonderful new um, mm-hmm. potential that's growing up. Um, expanded language, expanded uh, awareness of global song in different forms um, that we didn't have before when it was just Northern European, mm-hmm. among us Lutherans. Mm-hmm. And I think there's so much potential for that, for new expressions, you know, singing a, a new song um, for this day, for this time. And that's something that church music has always done um, and needs to continue to do. Mm-hmm. Um, that. Yeah, like back in the time of, of Bach, he was inventing new things, new forms, and in our day, we need to continue mm-hmm. to do that, and, and people are doing that, and I think that 
bodes well for the future. It's a balance. It is, yeah. Yeah. Well, that seems like a good place to to end. Thank you, Bob, for the wonderful conversation. Conversation, yes. And um, you have been uh, watching and listening to Profiles in American Lutheran Church Music for the Center for Church Music at Concordia University, Chicago. This interview with composer, cantor, and editor Robert Buckley Farley.